All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our weekly webinar this week. Just as a reminder, um, these webinars are intended for educational purposes only, and while we do hope that you learn new information, the trainers that present these webinars are not attorneys. Therefore, all information provided during the presentation and the Q&A session should not be construed, excuse me, as legal advice. <clears throat> All right, well, with that out of the way, um, good afternoon. My name is Brianna Grimes, and I would like to welcome you to our webinar today. We're going to be talking about relationships in the workplace. Um, and if you have any questions at all during the presentation, please feel free to type them into the question box, and they will be addressed during the Q&A session. With that being said, let's take a look at what we're going to be talking about today. So as far as our agenda goes, we're going to be talking about exactly what relationships we're talking about in terms of uh, the workplace, which relationships are we referring to. Also, we'll talk about those relationships in the context of conflicts of interest, as well as in the context of sexual harassment claims. We'll talk about the um, what about family owned businesses, you know, do they have a difference? Is there any protections for family owned businesses? Also, we will answer the question, should you have a policy in place and give you a little bit more guidelines on whether or not a policy would be good for your organization. And then we will finish off with a QA. and a All right, so it's that time of year again and Valentine's Day, as we all know it, is right around the corner. And this particular holiday is filled with love and titty bears and chocolates and cupids. Now, while all those things sound innocent enough, relationships can be very complicated, whether it's Valentine's Day or not. And they're especially complicated when they're in our workplaces. Now, when we talk about workplace relationships, we are referring to things like boyfriends and girlfriends, spouses, immediate family members, as well as distant family members and even roommates. Usually this involves when one person in the relationship either manages the other or when one person has significant control over their employment or employment related decisions. Now, a lot of employers don't think that these types of relationships in the workplace are that big a deal. Um, but the big issue is that they have a huge potential to become a big issue, not that they're a big issue right out. And if organizations are not proactive in dealing with some of these potential problems that they will run into, um, they tend to tack on a hefty price on the back end, whether that's in legal fees or litigation fees or, um, you know, even penalty fees, depending on the context of the relationship. <clears throat> So first, let's start by exploring relationships and conflicts of interest. Now, a conflict of interest in and of itself is essentially when one or more parties have separate interests that, you know, conflict with each other during a mutual activity. Now, for example, your company, uh, here's an example. So your company is concerned with treating all employees equitably and avoiding discrimination, which is illegal under Title VII. All companies should be concerned with that. But let's say one of your employees is more concerned with making sure their roommate doesn't get fired so they can pay rent. As that person's manager, this employee chooses not to write up their roommate or hold them accountable for their poor performance. Not only do these actions cause your company to lose money, but it also may open yourself up to a discrimination case because maybe the only other person on the team getting held accountable is part of a protected class. And now they feel like they're being singled out and discriminated against because of that protected class, because the other member of the team, who is the roommate of the manager, is not being held to the same standard. This is just one of thousands of possible situations that could arise from unregulated relationships in the workplace. And it's really hard for employers to anticipate each and every one of these potential um, situations. In my overall 10 year career in HR, I've investigated many of these situations from perceived favoritism to protecting a family member from flat out theft and fraud that was covered up by many intricate relationships in workplaces that just plain out went unchecked. Honestly, unchecked relationships that create conflicts of interest in the workplace have the potential to wreak havoc and cost companies millions of dollars in legal fees, lost productivity, lost product, theft, or even overpayment in things like wages, bonuses, and unauthorized overtime. Now, if that's not enough, there's always the looming potential for sexual harassment claims. Sexual harassment in and of itself is defined as a behavior characterized by unwelcome and inappropriate sexual remarks or physical advances in a workplace or professional and social situations. 
Now, when you have policies and regulations in place to either avoid relationships from forming in the workplace or even existing entirely in your workplace, you drastically minimize this potential risk for sexual harassment to occur. Now, whether or not sexual harassment training is required in your state, you are still bound by the laws that make harassment illegal. And sometimes employers get a little tripped up on this. Just because the training is not required doesn't mean the laws don't apply to you. Therefore, if you do not currently require harassment training for your employees and you have no defined relationship policies in the workplace, you're actually doubling your potential liability for harassment claims because you're really not doing anything proactive about them. Now, along with these claims um, can come expensive legal fees, fees for damages, bad PR, fees for, for penalties uh, for breaking the laws, decreased productivity, decreased morale, and increased administrative tasks. So a lot of these types of things can be avoided with the proper policies in place, and the cost on the back end for not addressing these issues proactively is just huge. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, that's not going to happen. People don't just sexually harass each other within relationships. You know, that, that doesn't happen that often. It's a one-off. You know, it's something you hear on the news when a big company doesn't pay attention to their employees or they have thousands of employees. You know, the list of reasons to explain away this logic goes on and on. And I've heard all of the excuses. Um, but what a lot of people fail to realize is that every relationship has the potential to become some form of sexual harassment. And here are some very real examples of how relationships have the potential to create liability for companies. When a relationship ends and one party doesn't want it to be over, that's a potential sexual harassment claim waiting to happen. One party is the supervisor over another, that's a quid pro quo sexual harassment claim waiting to happen. One party begins dating someone else either in or out of the workplace. That's either a sexual harassment or a violence crime waiting to happen. I've seen it happen before. Or even during a relationship, when both parties engage in inappropriate physical contact at work, a third party viewing the physical contact um, or maybe walked in on them doing something can file a sexual harassment claim because it wasn't handled by the employer. Also, when one party gets any form of favoritism because of the person they're dating, again, going back to that quid pro quo or that favoritism perception of sexual harassment. Now, as you can see, there are a lot of different ways that relationships can have the potential to turn into sexual harassment both during and after the relationship has run its course. <clears throat> Additionally, one of the main qualifiers to remember for a relationship to suddenly turn into a sexual harassment claim is one word, unwanted. When any behaviors, actions, or communication between two people becomes unwanted, it can go from a cute Valentine's Day love story to a sexual harassment claim waiting to happen. And they come with a big price tag, guys. Here are a few examples of very innocent behaviors that instantly become a sexual harassment claim if the receiver does not want to be the receiver. This can include leaving gifts or love notes on the desk, touching them on the arm or cheek, a kiss on the cheek, playing with someone's hair, eating lunch together, asking them out on a date, or even hanging around their cubicle. All of these actions can be sexual harassment claims given the right situation when one person um, decides that the behaviors are unwanted and makes that clear. Now, because of the extensive issues and potential liability that employers take on with relationships in the workplace pertaining to things like conflict of interest and harassment claims, it is highly recommended that you have policies and procedures in place to mitigate this risk. But before we jump into that, many people always ask me the same question. I get this question a lot, but what about family owned businesses? And unfortunately, my response is not one they wanna hear. I usually reply with, well, but what? Family owned businesses are just as susceptible to the liability as any other business. There is nothing special protecting them from these laws because they're family. In fact, in my experience, family-owned businesses get taken advantage of the most by their own family members. And when their family relationships get too numerous in the business, they actually increase their external employee claims rate 
by non-family members significantly because it creates a divide in the company of family versus non-family. And this can oftentimes um, be perceived as discrimination, favoritism, and even forms of hostile work environment and harassment. In fact, according to business journals, 70% of family-owned businesses fail because of a feud or a family-related issue within the company because the relationships were not regulated. Now, while there are many advantages to working and operating a family business, there are a lot of disadvantages too. And this comes from things like a lack of overall skills or experience in certain key roles, a lack of diversity for the strategy of the business. Think of it like a my way or the highway mentality. There's not a lot of new ideas that are welcome you know, in the conversation. Also, a lot of family-owned businesses have negative effects on the work environment and an increased hostile work environment claims rate. So a lot of things to think about when you're talking about relationships not being regulated in a family-owned business versus a non-family-owned business. Now, at this point, I'm not saying go out and fire all of your family members if you run a family-owned business. That's not realistic. What I am saying is that regardless of whether you own a family-run business or not, regulating all relationships in the workplace is essential for lowering that legal risk at the employment level. So that brings us to the big question. Should you have a policy in place to regulate and define relationships in the workplace? And the answer is yes, absolutely you should. There's really no business or legal reason why you should not have some form of regulation as to what internal relationships are allowed inside your business or what parameters you want on those relationships. Business owners have a right to run their business the way they choose so long as it conforms to the laws in place. And you should be able to dictate things like relationships involving family members, excuse me, <clears throat> um, relationships involving family members or involving members of management and the fact that they shouldn't manage people they're in a relationship with or related to. Also relationships that evolve in the workplace, what's allowed and what's not, what happens if a relationship does evolve. Even more so, what happens if those two employees get into a relationship and then they get married or they move in together and now the relationship is a little bit more serious than just dating? How are you going to handle that? So as a business owner, you're allowed to regulate these types of things internally in your business. Now, these policies for relationships and hiring family members and things like that, they are policies that can be customized to fit your business needs and what you think is appropriate given your own company culture. You know, as I stated in the previous handbook webinar that we did a few weeks ago, you always want to stay true to your company culture in all of your policies, procedures, and practices. But you also want to use them to protect your organization and remain compliant with laws both at the federal and state levels. So if you currently don't have one of these policies in place, I do recommend on your next handbook update that you strongly consider including it and begin implement it in your hiring and promoting practices going forward. If you have any questions regarding what you can or cannot put into this policy, you can always reach out to Kathy or myself with any basic HR questions. If you're a payroll client or if you're an HR services client, we can help you draft this policy. We're here to help and we want to make sure that you get the assistance that you need to be successful for these types of policies that really hone your business needs. All right, well, I know that was a lot of information to process, um, and I know there was a lot of different things on there. So if you did not get the chance, feel free to take a second right now and ask any questions that you have via the question box. Just as a reminder, this presentation was recorded and it will be available to watch again. Um, you, to do this, you can visit our website and hover your mouse over the webinars tab at the top and click on webinar recordings. The most recent recordings will be on the top, and these are usually posted within 24 hours of the live webinar. You will also be emailed a copy of the webinar recording tomorrow afternoon. All right, let me see if we have any questions at this time. All right, it doesn't look like we have any questions, but if you think of any questions at all, feel free to send me an email. My contact information is at the bottom of this slide. Also, just as a reminder, next week we're going to be talking about the benefits of training your employees using an LMS system. And Pay Entry is currently looking into adding an LMS system to our offerings. I mean, this is something we are hoping to roll out this year. So this is going to be a great introductory into how LMS systems work, what they are, and how they can benefit your organization. So I hope to see you guys all next week at that webinar session. You have a great rest of your week.